Hello fellow sim racers, and welcome to part 10 of this sim racing setup guide. This video is all about aerodynamic downforce and how changing the wing and ride height settings in downforce generating cars can heavily influence lap times. If you've not seen any of the earlier parts of this series, then a link to a playlist containing all of my setup videos should be in the top right hand corner of your screen. Everything we've talked about thus far has been concerned with mechanical grip, or to put it another way, maximising the grip produced by the tyres and suspension. People discuss aerodynamic grip as a separate concept because it's helpful to do so, but aerodynamic downforce is really just another component of mechanical grip, and ultimately it's just another tool we have to help influence how the tyres interact with the road surface. For the uninitiated, Aerodynamic downforce is generally produced by a car's floor, wings and the body profile of the car. And in short, it increases the load on the tyres, thereby increasing grip. When it comes to aero, the faster you go, the more downforce you get. But no matter how much downforce a car generates, the limiting factor for grip is still the tyres. When it comes to racing sims, there are generally two things we can do to influence the aerodynamics of a car. Alter the angle of the wings or splitter, and change the ride height or rake. But before we move into the detailed stuff, a small caveat. As with tyre models, various racing sims model aerodynamics in a variety of ways. Learning the ins and outs of the sim you're driving will have an impact on the setup choices you make. In particular, some sims care much more about how the ride height and rake influence aero than others, and even then it sometimes varies from car to car. So this is one of those areas where Google is your friend. As you increase the angle of attack of a wing with reference to its direction of travel, the amount of downforce that wing generates increases. This continues until the wing reaches what is known as its stall angle, after which the downforce it produces rapidly decreases. So essentially, if we want to add more downforce and therefore more grip, we can increase the angle of a car's wings. But this comes at a cost, in the form of induced drag. As air pressure drag increases, it resists the movement of the vehicle with a greater force. Simply put, more drag means slower acceleration and lower top speeds. So, setting the wings on a racing car is all about finding the right compromise between increased grip and therefore faster cornering and decreased top speed. Wings are also a useful tool to adjust the centre of aerodynamic pressure. This can be thought of much in the same way as the balance of grip, in that a car with a centre of pressure more towards the front will provide more grip to the front tyres and vice versa. It's important to remember that downforce increases with speed, so the wing angle will have little influence at low speed, but a huge impact when you're going very quickly. This is actually pretty useful because it means you can tweak the high speed behaviour of the car independently from the low speed behaviour, and that's one of the reasons people tend to mentally separate mechanical and aero generated grip. Before we move on, a word about the different types of adjustable front downforce. Single seater cars generally have front wings that allow for a wide range of adjustment. They also often have a front splitter, but these are usually a fixed part of the floor and not usually adjustable. Moreover, their purpose in a single seater car is primarily to condition the airflow to the underfloor and the diffuser, as well as meeting the minimum floor size requirements. Conversely, GT and other tin top cars generally don't have front wings, but instead you can normally fit different sizes of front splitter. In this type of car, the primary purpose of the splitter is to generate front downforce. The key difference from a setup perspective is that adding front wing angle significantly increases drag, while fitting a larger splitter is much less costly. Raising the angle of attack of the front wing or increasing the size of the splitter will push the balance forwards by placing more load on the front tyres. This can help reduce understeer in faster corners, but taken too far will start to induce oversteer. And of course, reducing the angle of the front wing will do the exact opposite. Raising the angle of attack of the rear wing will improve the grip to the rear tyres, shifting towards a more understeery balance, though rear wing increases often come with a heavy drag penalty. Conversely, lowering the angle of the rear wing will induce more oversteer and reduce drag. Modern racing cars that generate lots of downforce are incredibly sensitive to ride height and pitch. This is because, in addition to wings, they generate a significant proportion of their downforce using the floor of the car and the diffuser. Up to a point, reducing the ride height will increase the downforce generated by the floor of a car, and here's the kicker, without any significant increase in drag. But as with everything in car setup, 
there's an optimum window and if you push the ride height too low, you'll starve the underfloor of the air it needs to generate downforce. Finding the ideal ride height for an aero car can be tricky and a trial and error approach is often the only tool available. Thankfully, it's usually pretty obvious if the ride height gets too low as the loss of downforce is usually fairly dramatic in my experience. So, I tend to start with higher ride heights and decrease them incrementally until I stop feeling any benefit from going further. If your sim provides data about aero, this makes the job far easier, but driver feel and lap times are what really counts. Aero cars are almost always set up with a lower ride height at the front than at the rear. And if you remember from back in video seven, this is called rake. Keeping the front of the car lower ensures that downforce is generated rather than lift, which is counterproductive. Just ask Mark Weber and Peter Dumbreck. Altering the amount of rake or the difference in ride height between the front and rear moves the aerodynamic balance of the car. Generally speaking, increasing the rake will generate more rear downforce up to the point that the diffuser stalls. But what's key here is that very small changes in rake can make a big difference to the balance of the car. Because increasing the rake doesn't significantly increase drag, it's a great way of generating rear downforce free of charge. So a common approach is to get the floor and diffuser producing as much downforce as possible by setting the ride height and rake, and then using the wings and or splitter to balance the car. As a reminder, the ride height of the car needs to be very stable to keep the underfloor aerodynamics working properly. This is why modern aero cars are set up incredibly stiffly. So the impact of generating all of the downforce is that you'll need to run the car very stiff and pay special attention to the suspension bump stop settings to stop the car from bottoming out. As a final note, some modern high aero cars have what's known as a third spring or heave spring. This is an additional spring in the suspension setup that's only compressed or relaxed when the car is subjected to pitch changes. By running a stiff heave spring and softer wheel springs, this allows the car to be set up incredibly rigidly from the perspective of pitch, but still compliant enough to keep the tyres in contact with the ground during roll movement in the corners. But beware, body roll can also impact the aero efficiency of the floor. The goal when working on the aerodynamic settings for a car is to produce the most downforce possible while still trying to minimise drag. You can generate huge quantities of downforce in a modern racing car by getting the ride height and rake in their optimum window, and doing so generates very little additional drag. The wings also generate a lot of downforce, but they're very draggy. They are, however, excellent at trimming the car out by moving around the center of pressure or the center of aerodynamic balance. Aerodynamics is an incredibly complex subject, and hopefully this has provided a useful primer in the basics. If you want to learn more about the subject, I can thoroughly recommend the book Competition Car Aerodynamics by Simon Macbeth. Over the final videos in this series, we're going to start bringing everything together and talk about how to build a car setup, starting next video with a look at how to diagnose and cure certain handling issues. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then it would be great if you could hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you think this video will be helpful for others, then please consider sharing it. As always, Thank you for donating your precious free time by watching. It is very much appreciated. So all that's left to say is goodbye, thank you for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.